Thank you for joining us for QI Power Hour. This is Tracy Sharon, CEO at the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council. For those of you who are new to QI Power Hour, it's a free monthly webinar learning series hosted by the Health Quality Council. We bring together improvers from a variety of sectors with an interest in improving health and also learning about quality improvement related topics. All of our sessions are recorded and available on the HQC website following the event. Please feel free to share those recordings with your colleagues who are unable to join us today. And just a reminder um, that we are in audio broadcast mode, so everyone is um, muted, but there will be ways to share your comments and questions with us through the chat and the Q&A. I'll share that I am joining you today from HQC's offices in Saskatoon on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. And our organization, the Health Quality Council, also serves the entire province now known as Saskatchewan, which also includes lands that are parts of treaties 2, 4, 5, 8, and 10 as well. And as treaty people, we are committed to moving forward in partnership with Indigenous nations in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And so I'd ask, as we listen to the presentations today, as we all consider our commitments to our obligations as treaty people um, and our, our topic that we will be discussing, when we consider what it means to work together in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration for the mutual benefit of all, um, you know, some of the questions that we could be thinking about are, do we know what matters to older adults? Are we hearing from the full representation of older adults that we serve? And what actions can each of us take to ensure that services are respect, responsive, inclusive, and in response to what matters? And so I'd encourage us all to consider these questions as we listen to the presentations today, um, as we get more insight uh, into that from our speakers. As I said, all of our sessions are recorded. You can visit our website to access both this sessions and any past sessions that you might be interested in listening to. And if you find something that you like, please do share with your friends as well. While you're there, you can also sign up for the QI Power Hour email newsletter, and that'll let you know about upcoming sessions and details on how to register coming right to your inbox. Um, so you can do that on our website as well. Over uh, the last several years with QI Power Hour, we've been excited to see the continued growth um, and spread of, of the sessions throughout our, our home province of Saskatchewan, across Canada, and around the world. And so we want to thank you all for spending an hour of your time with us and for your commitment to ongoing learning to improve the systems that you're each a part of. As I mentioned before, uh, we are using the chat function on our webinar today, so please feel free to share your questions, your comments, and your ideas with us throughout the presentation. We will have time for uh, questions at the end, so I'll be monitoring the chat to pull out those questions to ask our speakers at the end. Uh, so please feel free to do that, and instructions to do so are on the screen, um, and you can feel free to test that out now uh, to say hello to everybody. And so, without further ado, um, happy to begin our session on what matters to older adults, rethinking care in aging and older adults with our special guests from the Saskatoon Council on Aging and the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism. So first up, we'll hear from the Saskatoon Council on, on Aging. And with us today, we have Candace Scrapic and Casey Hall. So Candace is a retired registered nurse. After a 40-year career, she has utilized her past education, experience, and expertise in a range of community volunteer activities and patient advisory roles. Candace's volunteer activities with the Saskatoon Council on Aging focus on promoting healthy aging and supporting quality of life, health, care, and health system reform. She's a dedicated advocate and enthusiastic volunteer working to elevate the voices of older adults to raise community awareness about issues of importance to them, their families, and their caregivers. As an older adult herself, she collaborates with other older adults and community partners to find and implement innovative solutions that will create a more age-friendly community. And Casey Hall has a Master's of Public Health and is a Certified Health Education Specialist with over five years of professional experience working in community health equity. Casey is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan with her research focused on investigating psychosocial factors, and social cultural factors that influence an individual's health behavior. 
She uses her unique health education skill set, public health perspective, and research lens to execute community engaged, population specific approaches to behavior change through knowledge translation. And Candace and Casey will share with us today uh, some findings on um, older adult vice voices, what matters most. So over to you. So Candace, you should be able to take control and switch the slides. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Thank you. So good morning, everyone, on this uh, very warm Saskatchewan summer day. Uh, before I begin, um, I, I want to just acknowledge that although KC and I are presenting today, we really are representing SCOA and SCOA uh, was, uh, older adult volunteers and their staff who uh, consistently work on uh, a, their deep commitment to improving the quality of life of older adults. So, um, we all aspire to grow old. Uh, we all would like to experience healthy aging and longevity, but what does that actually mean? And so our presentation this morning, we're going to try to answer that question. We have three objectives that we're going to try to explore with you. First of all, who, who are we? Who, who are these older adults we're talking about? And a little bit about SCOA, if you don't know us. Um, what older adults tell us about their experiences of uh, growing old uh, and particularly around their experiences with health and health care. And then um, a, a couple of examples of um, what uh, the, the way that SCOA works to um, collaborate with older adults to hear their voice directly uh, that can influence strategic planning. So who are we? Um, there, that's who we are. Older adults. Um, I, I want to say that um, this is what we're talking about today. Uh, and um, although there are close to 200,000 older adults in Saskatchewan, according to Stats Canada, um, it, it really is uh, challenging to um, it, to, to ask people to think broadly about the older adult population. So understanding your local population, where and how well people are living and aging is fundamental to creating local uh, aging programs and policies and healthcare um, uh, approaches. And it's a critical first step in addressing their health needs. There's not one universal experience of aging. Exper uh, experiences of older adults differ between individuals, uh, critically between population uh, sectors, between different parts of the province, between different generations, uh, and um, we're not a homogenous group. Uh, typically, people talk about older adults uh, as that group of seniors, but um, I just want to encourage you to try to be a bit more inclusive in your thinking uh, as we as we move along through the presentation. Oopsie, wrong arrow. So a little bit about the Saskatoon Council on Aging. Uh, if you don't know us, um, the uh, Saskatoon Council on Aging is a community-based nonprofit. Uh, we've been in existence for over 30 years. Uh, and works uh, on a, a whole range of issues of importance to older adults, uh, including more recently supporting them through the pandemic. So I would just encourage you to check out SCOA's website for a full, uh, more detailed description of the many programs and services and events that support older people to age in a positive way. Most importantly, SCOA engages older adults to identify issues that are important to them and that impact their quality of life and collaborate with them to seek um, evidence-based solutions. So we're going to give you two examples of how SCOA um, enters into this kind of collaboration uh, and a little bit about what older adults have told us through this process. The first example is our Age-Friendly Saskatoon initiative. 
For some time, older adults have expressed their concerns about the growing aging population and the apparent lack of government policies that reflect their needs and aspirations. So, uh, beginning way back in 2009, a group of older adult volunteers from SCOA decided to seek the opinions of older adults about that. Uh, and the goal was to promote a community conversation that would lead to changes in attitudes about aging and older adults, and also provide direction on how to create a more age-friendly city. So in 2011, SCOA launched the Age-Friendly Saskatoon Initiative based on the World Health Organization Global Age-Friendly Cities Guide. It was an ambitious project. It involved three phases. Uh, it took five years to complete, but it resulted in a rich set of evidence around what older people thought about aging uh, and what would improve their quality of life. It was unique because it actually was uh, a project that was led by older adults themselves. They provided the leadership in planning and development of the, of the project. Uh, and collaborated with community partners to complete all the phases. That's, this is just a very quick overview of what the project looked like. Uh, and uh, I would encourage you once again to go to the school website, the reports from our projects. There are three reports uh, and uh, those reports are there for you to take a look at. But the guiding principles were really about uh, before we could talk about what uh, planning might look like, we actually needed to build uh, communities uh, knowledge uh, about their understanding of older adult populations and align our work, not, not to duplicate work, but to align our work uh, supporting publicly um, public and, and community stakeholder groups. Uh, we partnered with the City of Saskatoon on this project uh, and with the University of Saskatchewan researchers. And it identified innovative ways to address uh, an aging population uh, and older adults shared the ownership of these ideas. Hundreds of older adults participated in the project with us. Uh, and through surveys, focus groups, and interviews, and they identified very clearly what it was like to grow old and their ideas of what they needed to improve their quality of life as they aged. So this is what they told us. 90% of older adults live independently in the community. Very few, a small percentage, require supervised care. They want to live at home and they want to stay out of hospital and they prefer home care to long-term care. They want to age in place, but in order for them to do that, they need the right kinds of programs, services and supports and they want to co-design them. Ageism is the greatest barrier that older adults face in accessing programs and services, both individual and systemic. Older adults also felt very strongly that there was not one answer to meeting their needs and that the entire community has a role to play in creating age-friendly environments, whether it is in, in uh, city services, health services, uh, and community uh, services. The government needs to be policy leaders, and they talk about provincial government, but also municipal government, and that community organizations, public health agencies, and, and the health authority, businesses, and individuals all have a role to play uh, in, in improving the quality of life of older adults. There, uh, the project resulted in 67 recommended actions that SCOA has worked since the completion of the project to try to implement. These are, this is a broad overview. Uh, some of the recommendations are very specific and some of them are, are higher level recommendations, but basically older adults said, first of all, engage us as co-leaders with you when you are planning programs and services that impact us directly. 
try to counter ageism, both your own individual ageist attitudes and the institutional policies that create barriers. Promote healthy aging and support aging in place, create age-friendly environments, both in acute care and long-term care and community-based care, adopt an age-friendly policy lens and collaborate with community experts who know how to engage uh, with older adults. So how do we work together to promote better health for older adults? First of all, we have to shift our thinking um, and uh, a recommit uh, on an institutional level and an agency level uh, to trying to improve the quality of life of older adults. People need a basic level of age-friendly education. They need to understand older adult diversity and how to engage with them. Uh, they need to be able to establish partnerships with other community agencies that have expertise in working with older adults on a whole variety of, of issues. Um, research development and implementation of new and innovative strategies. Older adults told us over and over again that the same old, same old does not work for them. They want to see innovation, creativity, and they have great ideas. So the, um, the response to the pandemic in the community and around the world rightly focused on protecting the lives uh, and preventing the spread of the virus. Unintended consequences, however, was a detrimental effect on the older adult population uh, who feel the full impact economically, mentally, physically, uh, including social isolation, challenges to our human rights, neglect and abuse in institutions, care facilities, and the trauma of ageist attitudes and discriminations. So once again, SCOA took the lead and um, identified that there, was, um, there were issues that were specific to the older adult population and that we needed to raise awareness about the impact of the pandemic specifically on older adults. We did some preliminary research that resulted in a white paper called Beyond the Pandemic, which is on our website. And then that led into um, uh, exploring uh, a more um, evidence-based research project. So I'm gonna pass it over to Casey, who is gonna talk now about uh, what that project looked like. Thank you, Candice. Um, my name is Casey. I have the privilege to work with the passionate volunteers of the Saskatoon Council on Aging, um, who put together this study that we'll be presenting to you. I just wanna check that I'm moving the ball uh, and our slides are advancing. Okay, um, so this was a two phase project. So the first consisted of an online survey that was designed by older adults for older adults. Um, an expert panel was consulted and this survey was done from November 29th of 2021 until February 1st of 2022. Um, we know there are several waves of the pandemic, but that's when this data was collected looking at um, health outcomes of older adults and how public health measures and impacted their well-being and the pandemic in general. We had 409 older adults um, engage in this online survey, so kind of breaking the myth that older adults won't participate in online surveys. Um, it's clear that if older adults design the online survey and promote an online survey, like older adults will take that survey. Um, the average age was 69 years old, about two thirds were female of the respondents, um, the other third were male. 60% were um, common law or married and with only 12% being single. 66.7% um, of our population also lived with another individual during the pandemic. And so these were demographics to note in the sample. Um, this survey asked about challenges. Their main challenges were accessing health care and access to usual physical activity. And that all falls within the frame of the World Health Organization's um, healthy aging frameworks. So we wanted to highlight that here for you. There were also positive effects experienced during COVID-19. So there was a lot of appreciation for a slower pace of life, um, growing respect for older adults and their needs. 
Additionally, there's more public awareness of issues faced by marginalized um, populations, and these were all highlighted as um, positive effects of the pandemic. There are several concerns during the pandemic, of course, about getting sick and loved ones getting sick, tremendous concern over the healthcare system being overloaded, um, and really concerned about not being able to visit loved ones during the pandemic. The most pressing needs of older adults that were captured are around policy and procedures to ensure safety of older adults um, that included in long term care homes. Um, as well as strategies to help older adults stay socially connected. Um, and those were highlighted and we'll talk about some of those things in the recommendations. So the second part of this um, project was to do a quality deep dive into what are recommendations. Um, and this kind of echoes the work that was done on the age friendly initiatives, very kind of um, how SCOA approaches their research and their programming. So we met with older adults, 49 of them to see what is it, um, what were their experiences, are our survey results in line with what they experienced and what are their recommendations moving forward? Um, where are areas and strategies that we can address? And what we basically have found out is seniors are pretty resilient and they find ways to make the best of things. You know, we are prairie people. Um, so we felt this quote really captured the essence of um, what came out of the focus group and what um, older adults were experiencing in Saskatoon and the surrounding area. The themes that all came out are we are contributors, um, older adults adapt, learn and grow. Um, we talked about their healthcare experiences division and rebuilding relationships in a divided society, the role of policy and policy makers, recommendations, and then also um, a list of SCOA's contributions. Today, we're just going to be talking about two of them that are probably most relevant for this um, group, but please note that we are writing up big reports that we hope to disseminate everywhere. So be on the lookout on SCOA's website for um, these reports that'll be coming out closer to the fall. So for adapting, learning, and growing, um, many older adults had several different types of coping mechanisms, um, including engaging with others and helping others. So older adults found new activities. Um, they went outside their comfort zone to try new things. And my favorite quote is about a 99-year-old woman who had cognitive impairments and was in a home, but learned how to use FaceTime um, to be able to have their family at least speak to them um, while they were in a long-term care home. Um, older adults have tremendous concern for others, and it's important for them to be engaged with others and to have that connection. So it was really clear in all these focus groups that there was worry not only about themselves, but really about folks who are alone. Um, additionally, they worried about folks who are in long-term care homes who were suffering terribly. Um, the stories about long-term care homes and um, what those individuals were going through with lockdowns. It was clear the older adults are willing to help others and want to help others. It's important to them. It's a value to them. Um, and people, older adults were taking care of multiple generations. So some people, some older adults had their parents still alive and were taking care of that generation, as well as their own children or grandchildren um, that they were being caregivers to and really stepping into many diverse roles to fill voids in their family and to take care of their family. The experiences with healthcare, there were positive, so there was a lot of support for telehealth services, and um, people felt that their appointments were on time, things ran more efficiently. Um, they really appreciated that family physicians and doctors were now getting paid for providing telehealth services and being able to do phone appointments. Um, people found that it was um, just more convenient for time and less waiting. Additionally, this was for other services where people had to go in multiple times a month to get a treatment. Instead of waiting four hours until there was a void, they had a scheduled 15 minute appointment. So they were able to have more time in their day. Um, additionally, overall, people felt that what needed to get done got done in the healthcare system. And um, they knew that healthcare workers were overworked, but they felt that they were taken care of. Some of the negatives in healthcare was that because healthcare increased, the standards were really varied and it was hard to know who did what and how to go about it. So are you faxing things, emailing things, phoning things, the Zoom appointment, um, and that got confusing for folks. 
Um, some people had mentioned that getting any hospital care was impossible. Um, they weren't able to get hospitalized for certain situations. Um, and there's genuine concern that um, doctors are leaving the province and how to get access to a family physician um, in Saskatchewan. Additionally, negative was delays in healthcare. Um, so for hip surgery, um, people are waiting two years or longer. Um, and these appointments are getting significantly postponed and the burden of quality and life that it has for the folks that are having to wait for these treatments. Thanks, Casey. Um, the, um, these two examples, the H. Randy Saskatoon initiative and the uh, pandemic survey, give you a, a bit of a flavor of the work that SCOA carries out. It's an essential model really for understanding the experiences of older adults. Um, and um, we continue to champion for, for older adults and creating an age friendly Saskatoon. We have a whole number of programs and initiatives that have come out of uh, our age friendly project uh, and the recommendations that will come out of this project. We will look at uh, how we begin to implement those recommendations as well. So, uh, I encourage you to uh, once again, check out our website and. Um, uh, look at at the kinds of activities underway with SCOA, and I will turn it back over to uh, Tracy. Excellent. Thank you so much, Candice and Casey, for sharing those those insights with us. Definitely gives us a lot to think about. Um, and I'd encourage folks who have comments, thoughts, or questions about what you've just heard to please um, share them in the chat. And I see that someone has done so already. So thank you so much. Um, and uh, we'll hear from the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism uh, next, and they'll be uh, sharing with us about the Home Supports Initiative. So on October 1st, 2021, the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism launched its Home Supports Initiative, a multi-pronged effort based on previous research about what older adults need to age well in their communities. Their presentation includes examples of advertising, which generated significant support and details of what home supports could be and how models could be developed and tested. And so with us today from the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism, we have Holly Schick and Linda Anderson. So Holly grew up in rural Saskatchewan and attended university in Saskatoon and Regina. Much of her working life has been with the United Church, working with congregations in a number of communities throughout the province and on the provincial staff. Uh, looking for an opportunity to do something different uh, resulted in her accepting the position of the executive director of the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism in 2009. And she's been working on projects and programs that allow various groups to collaborate, address issues and build a positive view of older adults are some of the things that she really enjoys about her work. Um, and some other interests include genealogy, playing bridge, theater and spending time with family and friends. And we're also welcoming Linda. Uh, so Linda's career um, has related to education and communication. She's been an elementary school teacher um, and education and communication provincial staff for the Saskatchewan United Church, head of communication for the United Church of Canada and executive director of the Calling Lakes Education and Retreat Center, plus 25, uh, over 25 years as a conflict resolution facilitator. She believes that as we age, we can and will contribute in a variety of ways. So after retirement, her significant contribution is with the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism as part-time communication, communication and ageism awareness staff. Welcome Holly and Linda, and we'll turn it over to you. Thanks very much, Tracy. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism uh, is a provincial nonprofit organization. We bring together other organizations that uh, are made up of or work towards uh, serving older adults uh, for the purpose of working together on various projects and particularly on advocacy around issues of importance to older adults. We have 18 member organizations with a collective membership of approximately 100,000 older adults. The Saskatoon Council on Aging is one of those member organizations. We also have a partnership with the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association. 
our vision is quality life for all older adults in Saskatchewan. One of the things uh, that we took on as part of looking at issues of importance to older adults is strategizing for positive aging. And what we did was in 2018 and 19, we did research to find out what it is that older adults want their communities to look like. What, do, what should communities look like if they're to be places where older adults can age well? As Casey mentioned, older adults do participate in surveys. We had 2,044 2, people responded to a survey that we did uh, around this. 33% of them were 75 years of age and older. Most of them were older adults and most of them were from rural communities. We covered six major areas in the survey uh, and they're up there on the screen for you. One of the things that we try to emphasize and have emphasized in this work is that older adults so often are seen as a health issue and that becomes the big focus. But there are many other areas of concern for older adults as they uh, try to age well in their communities. And we focused on a number of those. I do want to highlight today a couple of those things. First of all is housing. Uh, it, it is very important for older adults, they told us, to stay in their own homes as long as possible. And when they need or want to move out of their own home, whatever that may be, they want to be able to stay in their own communities or close to their own communities. So they want access to a variety of types of affordable and appropriate housing. Closely tied with housing is that people need accessible and affordable services to allow them to stay in those communities, to provide for their mental and physical health needs, uh, and also to provide the kind of social interaction that is so important for older adults and for all of us. Another of the major issues indeed is health care. Although older adults aren't just a health issue, health care often becomes an ever more important concern as we get older. So older adults, no different than many of us, of the rest of us in, in society, want access uh, to timely health care, uh, access to specialists when they need them, uh, afford affordable health care in whatever way uh, they need that to be. And they also need respite care. The reality is many older adults are indeed caregivers themselves. And so they sometimes need a break from that. They need support in being able to carry that out. And ageism is a factor in many areas of life for older adults. And that often becomes particularly true in the area of health care. I am going to shift it over to Linda now. Uh, thanks, Holly. Uh, so you, I might just mention that the total report of the survey that Holly's been talking about that we did back in 2018-19 uh, the full report can be found on our website, along with an executive summary, which uh, talks about the different areas more than we have time to do this morning. But what we'd like to talk to you about is how SSM then said, how can we move to further action in Saskatchewan? What areas should we be really concentrating on? What might make the most difference to older adults as soon as possible? And we decided to focus on that intertwined area of aging in place, which combines the housing and the aging, the well being of people as they age. So we support, we launched the Home Supports Initiative on October 1st, uh, 2021, 
the International Day of Older Persons with a flag raising at the legislative building and speakers. That included representatives from uh, the SUMA and SARM, the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association and the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, once again, extending the reach. And we really wanted to fulfill these objectives, or that's what we keep working at that you see on your screen, raising awareness, knowing that we need to have individuals, organizations, and communities grow together to demand action. Uh, we're working towards the tipping point. Uh, I don't think we've got there, but we've been creating uh, traction and we are maintaining contact and we continue to work on this initiative. Next. We decided that there were three phrases that are the keystone of Home Supports Initiative. They are understandable by everybody and we want them to become the mantra. And they have become that for us. Real options, better outcomes, lower costs. And who could argue with real options, better outcomes, lower costs? Next. So what does real options mean? Real options means that practical help, practical support, as well as medical support should be available, not just for people who are able to have the financial resources to pay for it, to find it, able to navigate systems and be able to find help if they need it, but these kinds of options that makes such a difference if you're going to stay in your own home as you age. There's no doubt that there is a deterioration of physical mobility and those kinds of things can happen. So if we had all older adults being able to access help with this kinds of practical support, staying in one's home becomes much more possible. Home supports should be an obvious direction to move. Uh, it seems to be a win-win for everybody involved. Older adults can continue contributing to their communities as volunteers, caregivers, mentors, taxpayers, voters, not to mention that they will have better quality of life, be healthier, happier people. Communities are going to benefit from those uh, older adults staying there as long as possible. If you took older adults out of most communities, you would find a, a gigantic hole left in the area of volunteers, uh, mentors, caregivers, all of those areas of the life of a community. Long-term care is another area that very much relates to all of this. It's not part of the focus exactly of home supports, that we're working on, but long-term care needs changes as well. And if we put in place more supports for older adults uh, to stay in their own communities, then what we find is that the long-term care facilities should benefit by having fewer demands on their human and financial resources and they too will be able to make shifts and changes and come up with a lot more creative ideas and possibilities for what long-term care could look like. Ah, and here's the nub, lower costs. This is that's not said with a smile, it's said with a sense of reality. As the older population keeps growing and growing in percentage, there is no way that we can afford to keep putting more and more lower, older adults into the very expensive residential care facilities. Uh, even now, according to so many studies, some of the people there could, could manage very well at home if they just had some of the supports that we've talked about. 
A key study that we have appreciated was done by Queen's University, the Aging Well, and it did demonstrate that the cost succeeded 60,000 in institutional care and quality home support was about one third that cost. And we have seen that as we research in different countries and different areas of North America. So that's kind of a general, uh, that's a fact that happens over and over again in people's experience. But home supports does require a provincial framework. We have to do this in Saskatchewan together with involvement from the government, the municipality, and as the folks from SCOA so clearly indicated over and over, older adults themselves have to be involved in planning and carrying out the ways in which this would work most effectively. Plus, we know that the costs, not every older adult in Saskatchewan has the same financial resources. We need to make services available in some sort of a sliding cost uh, basis with some subsidization. This example is from our speaker from our conference in uh, 2021. Uh, Shamandeep Shale came all the way live from Australia and she knew all about this program as she's the head of the program. And I think this slide says a huge amount about what happens. Australia has been working since 2013 on implementing the kind of thing we're talking about. They call it their Commonwealth Home Supports. But it, this slide shows you that of their aged care budget, 64% went to the residential care, serving 189,954. Go down to the bottom, the basic assistance took only 13% of their aged care budget and served uh, over 800,000 Australians. The home care was uh, at that point more looking at the medical side, the service packages is the way they had it uh, in 2020. And nonetheless, it was 16% and it served uh, 155,000. What they're doing in Australia, they're continually adapting. When you do this kind of work, you have to know that you continually adapt how you go about it. And what they're doing in Australia now, they've combined the home care and uh, the high care and the more uh, practical low care needs. And they're working on that basis as they continue on. And they find that the usage increases and the costs remain in that kind of uh, a split, that kind of percentage split. As we've been working on home supports, we have been working to come up with what the key principles uh, and the key components of a home supports program need to be. Linda has mentioned a couple of those things, uh, including that uh, ongoing participation of older adults in whatever collaboration we have. And it's going to require collaboration between municipal, provincial governments and older adults and organizations that are involved, uh, have awareness, have information, have experience to share. I'm going to talk a little bit about the components. As Linda also mentioned, a provincial framework is important. If we're really going to serve the needs of older adults through home supports, it's not going to happen in little bits and pieces carried out by various groups and organizations. Various organizations might be part of providing services, but we do need that provincial framework. We need the provincial support. And that is going to mean that the provincial government is going to have to put some resources into this. As you heard, it should in the long run mean less cost in terms of providing services because keeping people in their own homes does indeed cost so much less than having to put them into long-term care. And put them into uh, is what often happens. People get uh, shifted into long-term care long before they need to be 
because the services aren't available. The same services need to be available to everyone. The delivery is going to vary in different locations. It's not going to be the same in Regina as it's going to be in Pontex or some other small rural community. Um, but it's possible to deliver the services that are needed if we get creative about that, think about the possibilities. We need an assessment and accreditation process for the service providers. If the services are going to be provided by a variety of individuals and groups, and some might be volunteers, uh, many will be businesses, uh, uh, groups that are able to provide services and are perhaps already providing services. We need to ensure that the qualifications are there, that the people are trustworthy, uh, and that there's consistent service standards. And one of the other things that people tell us over and over again is important to them is consistent service providers, uh, whether that's in home care, uh, people who are providing uh, medical or personal care services or in providing services such as helping with housework or yard work. You want to know you can trust the person and it's just so helpful when you can get to know that person a little bit because they are the same person from one time to the next. There also needs to be an assessment for the potential users. Uh, different people as Linda mentioned, are going to have different abilities to pay for those services. And we're not suggesting that services should be entirely free. If people can afford it, they should be able to pay for those services or contribute toward those services. What we want to make sure of is that no one gets left out. So if somebody can't afford those services, they still need to have access to those and hence the idea of a sliding cost for services. So here we are. We're trying our best to continue to gather support, momentum and raise awareness. And we're using every imaginable communication effort that we can. We have found that uh, paid content ads are reaching people. Uh, they are on some of them on Facebook, I've included uh, the ability to uh, offer us support in a real way to sign up with a name and a, at an email address. Uh, we have uh, worked with Post Media very successfully. And just this past year, they produced a little video that gives you the feel of what it would be like to have home supports in your home. A little three minute video. It's available on our website, another place where we might go next. And uh, there's our website address. And I'm thinking the chat that we put some links in. Uh, but we're using all of these methods, social media and media of all kinds to try to gather the support that's needed to influence uh, governments, but also to raise that area, that awareness in communities so people understand what could be possible to discover that, hey, that's what we said we wanted. Oh, people think it's possible. Let's get going. We have been strengthening connections with our own member organizations. We've had conversations with provincial government, with the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association, with the Saskatchewan Association of Rural Municipalities, with those folks all together uh, in the same uh, conversation. And we're making some progress, but there's a long way to go yet. We're very pleased to now be also in conversation with the Saskatchewan Health Quality Council, and we're planning a gathering of allies for this fall. So, keeping in mind, this is possible. And our community of advocates that are committed will be what makes the difference in whether there's action taken. So if you want to be sharing, go ahead.
adults say conclusively they want to live in their own homes where they choose. Governments tell us they want older adults to live in their own homes. Does it not make sense to provide the affordable, practical, accessible supports that are necessary? Thank you so much for listening to us and I'm going to turn it back over to Tracy. Excellent. Thank you so much, Holly and Linda. I can feel your energy coming through the, the computer screen. Um, so we have a few minutes uh, for questions from our listeners uh, to our entire panel of speakers. And we've been keeping an eye on the chat and there's a few things that have come up there. So I'll, I'll share that. And if folks are thinking of questions, feel free to do that and enter them in while I'm, while I'm sharing the ideas that have come forward so far. So Joanne has shared just a couple of, of ideas that have been tried in, in, um, in her community. Um, so a couple of interesting ones here in Assiniboia, the Kinsman Club bought iPads for the long-term care and hospital, and they scheduled a care aid to exclusively take the iPad around to the residents and patients that had family FaceTime scheduled, and that was hugely successful to help keep people connected. So just a good example of adapting on the fly and trying something new um, to try to keep people connected. So that was a great, great share there. And she's also shared um, appreciating the the bullet point about the need for multilingual services and and translation and just pointing out that the SA, the SHA the Saskatchewan Health Authority has set up a province-wide phone translation service um, works well and covers many languages and is available 24 7. so always good to to raise awareness about good ideas that are already out there uh, for any folks that haven't heard about that then we also have a question um, so uh, Appreciating that over 2,000 respondents responded to the survey, I'm not sure in which this was uh, pointing out to, but it sounds like both projects had really great response um, to to the the surveys and the focus groups and the interviews. So they were wondering uh, a bit about the recruitment approaches that were used. So wondering if you could say a bit about those. Uh, I could say a little bit uh, about what we did. Uh, we uh, distributed. Uh, the survey uh, through our member organizations with their 100,000 uh, members uh, in total. We also uh, uh, made it available, so it was made available online uh, and in paper format, and we made it available through our Grey Matters magazine, which we send all over the province, and so many people chose to um, get the survey out of that and send us back a paper copy or the address so that they could uh, connect to the online survey was in there as well. So it got quite wide distribution through the province. Thank you. And Candice or Casey, did you want to comment on, on your methods as well? Mm -hmm. um, uh, very similar to what Holly was describing was how we connected with older adults for our survey as well. Um, our uh, survey was not provincial in scope. It, it focused primarily around Saskatoon and, and the rural communities around Saskatoon. Uh, that was our target group. And uh, we circulated uh, primarily through our, um, the SCOA's distribution list, which has over 4,000 um, people as part of that distribution list. Uh, as well as advertising it through our uh, coming of age newsletter, through our e-news, through our Facebook and uh, Twitter accounts. Uh, so there was a, a range of, of ways that we um, communicated about the survey. It was online, but we also provided people with the option of a phone-in survey if they needed to complete it that way. And as well, uh, the option to volunteer to participate in our focus groups uh, as part of the survey. And so that was how we selected people for the focus groups. Uh, it was people who had completed the survey and um, indicated an interest in talking further and exploring uh, other ideas with us. Excellent, thank you. Sounds like giving lots of options is the key. <laughs> Um, uh, just another comment here, just saying thank you so much uh, for the presentation and also acknowledging your energy and commitment to improving life for older adults and uh, being appreciative for that. Um, oh, so here's a question that's popped up. So uh, this is probably our last one. This might be the, the last one we have time for. 
So how do you see the health system organizations supporting a home supports initiative or other initiatives that might focus on improving health and, and services for older adults? I, I think uh, probably a process <clears throat> needs to be uh, developing what would be possible. So number one, collaboration between the organizations, uh, the governments, uh, all forms of government, uh, older adults, and perhaps what we need to do is uh, fund some realistic pilot projects in communities that are willing to try something out. And that might well uh, give us data then to go on to say, how would you form a provincial system? So that's one way that you might go from collaboration to action, evaluation, and then move on to uh, trying to expand that, learn from that to develop the kind of system we would need in Saskatchewan. Great ideas, thanks, Linda. Any other thoughts? Uh, I think that the uh, notion of collaboration is really important and forming partnerships of like-minded uh, uh, groups and organizations in your community. I think when we think about it, um, it's, uh, it, it, it comes down to a very local level of initiative, um, engaging with the people in your um, area, in your primary health network, uh, and to, to hear from them about how they see health services uh, benefiting them and what kinds of ideas they have around how to make that more accessible to them. Thanks, Candice. I know that really resonates with something I've learned from my improvement mentors about kind of improving at scale is that you, mm -hmm. you know, you design, you build frameworks um, at scale, and then the improvement is self itself is local. So there's that, you know, local co-design testing and implementation and supporting people to be able to do that is, is key. I think someone else was about to speak. I'm sorry if I cut you off, please go ahead. No, it's okay. I, I was going to just add into the thoughts that one of the, the areas that provides a certain uh, area of support for older adults in their own homes is home care. And home care needs to be vastly uh, expanded, uh, made more uh, uh, useful for folks in a variety of situations, not just covering very, very basic medical and personal care needs, and in some ways, hardly covering those at all because often there's not enough time for people to actually uh, provide the services in the most helpful way or to actually engage with people. So that's another area where the health authority uh, needs to be part of that conversation. And in fact, in the past, many of the kinds of things we're talking about, about housekeeping uh, and so on, were actually part of home care at one time. So the two things need to work very closely together to provide all of the services older adults might need to stay in their own homes. Great, thanks so much, Holly. Well, so many things to talk about, so many things to consider. Uh, unfortunately, we only have a couple of minutes left, so I'll have to move on, but I'd encourage folks, so we've shared out some links to uh, Saskatoon Council on Aging's website, the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism, and all of the reports are all available there. Um, there was a link shared in the slides to the short video that's been prepared, so I'd encourage all of you to check that out and to please engage uh, with these organizations and other, other partners in, in your communities um, to, to learn more. So I wanna give my sincere thanks uh, to our presenters, to Holly and Linda and Candace and Casey uh, for joining us today to share your work. And uh, what you may not have known when you agreed to do this is that you will become the proud recipient of some I Love QI socks, very stylish uh, and very in demand. So um, thank you so much and you watch your mailbox for those. Um, and if, if those of you listening um, want to get your hands on some I Love QI socks as well, uh, please do uh, reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you if you'd like to become a QI, QI Power Hour speaker and uh, share your work or your story or your improvements with us. We'd love to hear from you, so please do. And uh, again, our sincere thanks to our, our presenters today. 
Um, when you leave the webinar, the screen will pop up. It's going to try to take you to a survey. Uh, we'd really hope that you'd continue on and fill that out. So don't be alarmed. It is a safe link to click, um, but we'd really appreciate your feedback on the session, uh, what we've done well and what we can do better next time. We do uh, use that feedback to continuously improve our QI Power Hour. So thank you in advance for sharing your thoughts. And uh, we welcome you to join us in September uh, for our next session. Uh, we will be taking a little break in August, but we'll be back in September and we'll be welcoming uh, the Saskatchewan Advocate for uh, Children and Youth uh, to say more about the report called Desperately Waiting, the Advocates Review of Mental Health and Addiction Services for Young People in Saskatchewan. So very important topic to learn about. I'd encourage you all to tune in um, at that time as well. And with that, I uh, wish you all farewell for today. I uh, hope you can get out and enjoy the beautiful weather and take care and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Thank you.